allowed to. Um, I'm ready if you guys are. Good to go? Awesome. All right. So I guess over there. My name is Andrew. My talk is called Ballin' on a Budget, Tracking Chinese Threat Actors on the Cheap. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Andrew Morris. I am a security engineer for a company called ISEC Partners. Uh, I literally just moved back to South Carolina. They're based in New York, um, but I just came back and I'm working remote now, so glad to be back in South Carolina. Um, ISAC Partners actually doesn't do much of this stuff, I, I, or I don't rather. I'm a pen tester there, so I usually do um, you know, network app stuff, all that, all that fun stuff. Uh, this is my Twitter information, this is my email if you guys want to yell at me about how much my talk sucks or anything like that, and that is fine with me. Oh, also, before I even get started, I had uh, literally one hour of sleep last night uh, because some crazy thing happened. So if it starts getting real loopy up here, that is completely my fault. And I apologize in advance. One way or another, this is about to be hilarious. So let's get started. So today, um, basically, I'm going to tell you how I tracked a group of threat actors uh, with no money. And I'm going to show you how you can do it too. So basically, this is kind of the little synopsis that we're going to follow. So what is threat intel? What is threat intelligence? Basically, you're going to be gathering, gathering intel, it's threat intelligence is gathering intelligence on your adversaries or bad guys in general, predicting and preventing attacks before they happen or after they've happened, whatever. Threat, bad guys, intelligence, trying to predict the future. Hopefully that makes sense. So tons of companies, um, do some kind of threat intelligence stuff. I mean, like, you know, we had Jason mention Mandiant earlier. There's a ton of companies that do that. They, they release like the APT1 report and then, you know, CrowdStrike does that kind of stuff there. There's, there's a ton of companies that do it and have been doing it for a long time. But, uh, you know, those are, those are some of the big ones that market heavily. We can do it too. Not that hard, as it turns out. It's hard to do it like crazy like how they do it, but we can actually do it. It's, it's not too terribly hard to break into as an individual security researcher and start tracking bad guys and all that fun stuff. So let's talk about it. So how do you threat intelligence? Uh, basically, what we're going to be talking about is setting up a network of sensors or honeypots, monitoring them for attacks, aggregating said data, locating, securing, and analyzing artifacts that are left behind by bad guys, locating key adversary infrastructure, stuff like command and control and like DNS servers and web servers that they're using to propagate malware, whatever, and then profiting. How actual companies do it, by the way, like people who aren't just random security dudes uh, doing presentations, uh, most organizations, they have antivirus-ish software that, that they install that they install on their clients' machines and they drop managed little honeypots in the networks and stuff like that. And then the sensors look for indicators of compromise, IOCs, if you've ever heard that before. And that can be anything from like the MD5 of a file that's known to be evil or connecting to an evil domain that only is going to be connected to by malware or registry keys or user agents or anything like that. There's a ton of different uh, flavors that indicators of compromise can come in. And a lot of the times they'll say like, you know, one isolated event is just like, oh, you know, whatever, it's a one-off thing, these things happen. And then more than one of the same indicator across the enterprise is like, okay, we've got like an APT or we've got somebody that's like moving around our infrastructure or whatever. And then they, you know, they collect the targeted, the malware artifacts of like the targeted attackers and then they, you know, they reverse it and write up big reports and make money and all that fun stuff. This is how we are going to be ballers on budgets because I'm assuming that you, are trying to do the same thing that I did for the duration of this talk, which is do really cool stuff without spending a lot of money. We're gonna be setting up our own honeypots. We're gonna be monitoring attacks. We're gonna have a management interface and we're gonna be doing log review. We're gonna locate a group of attackers. We're gonna scrape their web servers and we're gonna to try to collect as much malware as we can. We're gonna to try to figure out who they are. We're going to try to analyze their capabilities, secure their artifacts, correlate the data that we find. We're going to try to track their other targets. That's where it gets uh, kind of exciting. We're going to try to see who else other than us they're targeting, see, see what we can do there. And then we're going to talk about some defenses. If you, run, if you do run a network or an, an enterprise or anything like that, 
Um, we're going to talk about, you know, like some firewall rules and indicators and write-ups and all that good stuff. So what we cannot do, we are ballers on budgets. We're not big fancy companies that do incident response, so we don't have access to a lot of really cool data. Um, we, we, I'm assuming that for, you know, for what we're talking about today, you don't do incident response. And you, your, entire, your attack surface is whatever it is that you're given. It's whatever you set up. You don't have an organization that you're trying to protect. You, you are, people are not calling you in and giving you access to super cool malware that like China Elite Unit 1 wrote. Um, and we're going to be focusing on, on mass attacks on the entire internet, not so much targeted attacks. And we're going to basically just be tracking kind of dumb groups that have crappy operational security, which we'll dig into a little bit. And specifically, uh, what we're going to talk about today is groups that spread malware via crappy SSH passwords. They just guess them, and that's it, and then install malware. Mm. So just real quick, a quick malware primer. Uh, for people who have lives. Um, most malware uses the conventional C2 model, command and control model. And most malware is used to perform distributive denial of service attacks, uh, or at least most unsophisticated malware is. So the command and control model, the conventional command and control model, is basically you've got a bunch of computers that get infected with some kind of malware, they all join one centralized thing or have some medium that they can connect to one thing or communicate with one thing. Maybe it's an IRC server, maybe it's a web server or whatever. And then the actual actor behind that, as you can see over here, the bot master, I don't know where I found this by the way, it's like one of the worst diagrams I've ever seen in my life, but man, what are you gonna do? Um, the, uh, the guy behind the malware is going to log into that so he can centrally manage all of the evil compromised computers. And that's just kind of a dumbed down, a, a pretty blanket way of describing kind of the conventional C2 model. The groups that we're looking at scan the entire internet for SSH servers. Once they have found SSH servers, they automate, they run automated scripts that run brute force attacks on these and they look for common credentials and easily guessable credentials. We'll dig into the actual specifics of what they're looking at in a little bit. When they get a successful login, they are, there's, it's basically an automated script that's logging into the server, running something like uname-a, which is gonna give you information on the system, or any kind of command that's gonna give it information on what kind of system it is that they've just compromised, and then based on the output of that, based on what type of system it is that the malware has, or that the script has logged into, it's going to pull down a certain type of malware. Like, for example, if it's, okay, this machine is a 64-bit Linux system. So then it's gonna say like, okay, and then it's gonna pull down some 64-bit Linux malware, and it's gonna run it like that. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is actually setting up our infrastructure. And we're gonna talk about honeypots. So can you, by show of hands, can you raise your hand if you know what a honeypot is? Awesome. I was giving this talk at another point um, and I asked that question and literally nobody raised their hand and I was like, this talk is going to suck really bad for all of you. So I'm glad that we've got a good show of hands for that. What is a honeypot? Just in case you were like the two people that didn't raise your hand just now. A honeypot is an intentionally vulnerable server or application that serves literally no business purpose. Its only purpose is to attract the attention of bad guys so that you can gain information about them. So we're ballers on budgets. We want to set up some machines on the internet that are vulnerable. We don't want to spend money, or at least we want to spend as little money as humanly possible. So we're going to look for some cheap hosting options, some cheap virtual private servers, or some cloud instances or whatever. So I've got a couple of uh, recommendations here, things that I've used. Uh, one of them is a company called Cloud at Cost. Um, if you have heard of them, they have this deal where you can get a server where you pay $35 one time ever, and you get that server forever. I don't know how that's scalable, but apparently it works out for them. And I'm basically just buying as much as I can until they realize what a horrible business mistake they've made. So eh, what are you gonna do? Um, the cons are that it is actually, they do have kind of crappy uptime and uh, they are slow and kind of unreliable, the VPSs themselves. Um, there's also another 
price model where you can pay $1 a month, which might be cool if you're just kind of dipping your toes in the old balling on a budget plan. And then another thing that you can use, you can look at is Amazon Web, Ser uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS. They actually have a couple of like micro tier instances that anyone can get free. Um, so you can get like really, really simple, like very, very weak, but you know, effective VPSs or servers that sit on the internet and you don't have to pay anything. So just a quick note about operational security when you're configuring your infrastructure here. Do not reuse any of your own passwords on your servers that you're using. Don't put any data on the machine. Don't put anything personally identifiable on these machines. These machines are going to be targeted by the kinds of people that you don't want to piss off. So try to be as shady as possible when you're setting these up. Assume that the machine will literally, like your honeypots will be compromised literally at any moment. Put no data on them, don't use them for mail servers, don't use them for anything else, don't install a honeypot on your own machine, God help us all. So then step two, management. How do you manage it? You've got one or maybe you've got five honeypots on the internet or maybe you've got 100. There's a company called ThreatStream. They're one of those threat intel companies that I was talking about earlier. My cup has a hole in it. What are you gonna do? It's just one of those days. Um, ThreatStream has a, they're a threat intel company and they have a, an open source product that they have released called the Managed Honey Network. They've changed the name of it like a hundred times, but whatever. Um, you can get it on GitHub. I've got it at the end of the presentation. It looks like this. It's basically, you log in, you, you tell all of your honeypots to communicate with one centralized kind of repository, and they feed all of their logs in. Oh, God, you're the man. Thank you so much. Um, I wish that happened like in real life when you're like, I have a problem, and someone's like, yo, I got you, man. Um, so it's basically, you know, you, you have one, it's like a dashboard and it aggregates all your data together and it tells you, you know, here are your top attackers, like here's the top stuff that we're seeing. And it's cool because it's free and we're not trying to spend money right now. So this is also, it's got a sweet little honey map feature where when you're getting attacks, it actually puts these cool little dots so you can feel like a total badass, like looking at the map light up and you're feeling like you're super cool. Um, so it's a really neat project um, and it's awesome that it's free. So the actual honeypot that we're gonna be using is called Kippo. And uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of Kippo before. Awesome, got a good show of hands there. So Kippo is written by some random dude in Python and it's basically a, it's an SSH honeypot and if you were just a random dude and you found a Kippo instance and logged into it over SSH, you would have no idea right off the bat that it's not a real SSH server. I mean, like, you can run commands, you can do all this stuff, but nothing's actually happening. It's just pretending, and it's logging everything you do. So it records attacker sessions. You can configure it to accept however many passwords or however many usernames you want. You can configure it to accept any username or password, but that might kind of tip off attackers a little bit. Um, and it hooks, it hooks wget, so when they like try to pull down malware or whatever, it actually snags that sample um, onto your file system. That feature is kind of shady. It, it, it's kind of seedy, it doesn't always work. Well. So a couple notes about Kippo though, just so you know. Um, there are some tricks that you can use to, as, as I'm a pen tester, so I always think about this kind of crap. You can identify Kippo instances from the outside. Like when you're scanning it, there are patterns that the um, actual sequence numbers when it's responding to you will follow. So before you even log in, you can identify that something is a Kippo instance. Fortunately, the attackers that we're talking about right now are not sophisticated at all and they don't do any of this. Hopefully none of them ever see this presentation. Um, internal tricks, once you've logged in to a Kippo instance, there are a couple little weird logic bugs. Like if you type ping, 999.999.999, like an IP address that blatantly cannot exist. It's like, oh yeah, I'm pinging that address. Yeah, it's good to go. So that's another thing. I mean, there's, there's a couple little things like that. Also, no one's ever really done a review of, like a security review of the code itself. So there are probably vulnerabilities there, but eh. So we've set up our infrastructure. We've set up our Kippo instance, and we've set up the managed honey network. We've got our honey pots feeding all of the data into our centralized management system. And we're still balling on budgets. We've spent at this point probably like $6. So once the attacks begin, we've got some balling on a budget style data analytics, which consists of some bash one-liners that I wrote to give you uh, some pretty cool data. 
that's not showing up too terribly well. It kind of backfired. I tried to look like Neo and use green text. I'm gonna remember that for next time. But basically what we're seeing here is these are, if you do, if you run that command on the logs, these, it's gonna to return to you the top 25 passwords that attackers are using against your infrastructure. This was the data that I pulled. This is actually real data, by the way. So the number one password that's used is just a dash. The number two password is just an underscore. And then after that, you're gonna see, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, password, admin, stuff like that. This is the top 25 attacker IP addresses. So this kind of stuff is really useful. Oh, actually, before I even go on, the reason that the passwords are useful is because the reason that they're using these passwords is because they are effective. So if you have a password policy or anything like that, make sure people, make sure you're auditing things against stuff like this so people cannot use these things. Alternatively, if you are a pen tester, use these lists because they're tried and true when you're trying to break into other people's stuff because somebody else has spent a lot more time than you have gathering this data. Same thing with the IP addresses. These are IP addresses that are either compromised or belong to bad guys. There are some of these that like, there are entire blocks of IP space that you're just gonna get so many attacks from. And uh, again, like these are, it's, it's really useful from a, from a lot of different ways. If you're a defense kind of guy, just block these IP addresses or you know, whatever, or, look, or do research on them, try to figure out who they are, stuff like that. I actually also wrote this thing called Tracker. Um, it's a great name, I know. Uh, tracker that basically whenever you get, whenever a bad guy successfully guesses one of the passwords to your honeypot, uh, it actually sends you a text on your phone using Google, uh, Google Voice. The, it's on my GitHub. It's kind of broken right now, but if you actually care, send me a text and I'll, or shoot me an email and I'll fix it. Um, so a quick recap of what we've learned so far. We've learned what threat intelligence is, kind of, and we've learned how to set up and operate our infrastructure. So the next thing that we're gonna look at is actually locating a specific group, right? Hmm. So successful logins with Kippo look something like this. You know, you play them back and you're gonna, oh God, you guys can't see that. Um, it's basically, you know, somebody logs in, they try to pull down some malware or whatever. I actually, I think, I, yeah, I have a, a quick demo I can do here, hopefully this works. Can you guys see that? Okay, great. Um, can you guys see that if I run this? So this is actually a recording of a set of an attacker literally running attacks against my machine. And if you look really, really closely, you'll see that they're all pretty much failing because it's trying to do some janky bash commands that are just, the syntax is terrible, and, or either that or it's my box just doesn't like them. Anyway, this is the, what the form of the attacks usually looks like. And this is like real time kind of like, this is exactly what bad guys are typing into your stuff as they're typing it into your stuff. And I know you probably can't see it too terribly well, but what, what's happening here is there's, it's running a command to stop your firewall, to w get a piece of malware from some random server, to chmod it with executable permissions, and then to execute that malware. So if we were an actual server, we would have just gotten owned, but we're not. Or just a Kippo instance, because we have too much time on our hands. So you're basically, when you actually go back and you look at the URLs for, um, for uh, where the, these different scanners and like where these different actors are getting their malware from, you are always going to, like 99.9% .9 of the time, you're gonna see these things called HFS or HTTP file servers. And it's basically just, it's like a web server that just serves files, it's crazy. And they in, the cool thing about it is they index, it, there's a directory index, so you can see all of, you can list the contents of all of the files. You, not only that, you can see the sizes, you can see the date of when it was uploaded, and you can see how many times it has been downloaded, which is awesome when you're trying to track like how big a campaign is, or when they updated their malware last, or anything like that. But it's also cool because if you've got a bad guy that's running multiple malware campaigns or has a lot of different malware samples, he's balling on a budget too. So he doesn't want to get a bunch of different um, a bunch of different web servers. He's going to put everything on one web server. You can snag all of those malware samples and you can do analysis on all of them. The reason it's pretty cool is sometimes you'll actually get Windows malware through these attacks. And like, so it, it's, it's really, really awesome to see like the way that the attackers operate like this. Uh, another note, just kind of real quick, the particular 
um, web server that bad guys use, again, is HTTP file server, HFS. This thing has so many vulnerabilities. Like, not saying I have ever done it, nor would I ever, but if you wanted to gain a lot of information on these bad guys, and you also wanted to violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, you could like moonwalk into these servers and, you know, and figure out, you know, get a lot of other information. I would advise against that. Like I said, there's a bunch of Windows malware on these things too, um, in addition to like Linux elf binaries. So when you start to see binaries, when you start to catch malware, you can do some quick internet recon to figure out if anyone else has seen that malware before, just like Google the MD5 or submit it to different places. I love it when I get no results on this, because I'm like, yes, I'm the first person to find this, it's awesome. Nobody cares, but I think it's awesome. But like, let's say like, what if you suck at reverse engineering and you, re like, you have your malware samples, but like, you're not a reverse engineer, you wanna find out like, what is the capability of this malware? Why do I suck at this so bad? It's actually, it's all good, because there's websites like malware.com and VirusTotal which are their websites that have like sandboxes and analysis engines and all this fun stuff. So they will do these whole automated reports for you and give you back the majority of the information that you're gonna need for almost any kind of like relatively unsophisticated malware and even stuff that is kind of sophisticated. Um, malware.com is a free online Cuckoo sandbox. If you've ever used Cuckoo before, uh, it was written by, or it's run by the same guys that wrote Cuckoo. Uh, it's got great reports. There's like over 200,000 malware, or maybe it's like 2 million malware samples on there. I have no idea. Um, private options enabled, so if you have a piece of malware that you don't want the rest of the world to have, you can check a little box and say, don't share this, versus with VirusTotal. They're like, nope, I'm going to give it to everybody. Um, but, you know, and it only does behavioral analysis with uh, Windows binaries. Um, this is what uh, malware.com report looks like. Uh, you can go over to like static analysis and like network analysis and drop files, all that cool stuff, it's great. Uh, VirusTotal is like a cool snapshot of AV reports. Uh, it has some behavioral analysis, um, but it doesn't really do behavioral analysis on elf, uh, elf binaries or anything like that. So this is kind of the fun stuff. I'm gonna talk about a particular group that I'm tracking and have been tracking for like the last I don't know, like three months or something. Um, I call him Chulang, uh, which is actually, I work with this Chinese guy and I was like, what does this word mean? And he told me it actually means gang. It's a word for, uh, there's a former, or it, it is a gang. It was a former, uh, this, uh, this gang in China. Uh, I named them that because there's a, some of the malware passes that as a string when it's like checking in to the, uh, to the server. So I was getting hit a lot by a particular group. And when I say that, like, it's a particular group, the reason that I know this is because it was coming from the same handful of IP blocks. Um, they were just guessing a massive amount of passwords across a lot of my different servers. Some of the malware samples that I was getting, a lot of the times had a lot of similarities in it, where it's like basically the same malware, but it just had like a couple of different bytes changed, so the MD5 was different. So I snagged a bunch of their malware samples. One of those malware samples, I actually kind of sucked at reverse engineering Linux malware, so I was like, eh, I'm not gonna do that. But, um, but I got some of their Windows malware, which is cool, because I'm a little bit better at that. Um, and I was giving this talk at one point, and I had some people, and I really, like, I know that, um, you know, Jason made some great points about, like, let's not blame everything on China, and he's right. Um, I am completely blaming this on China, just because, um, there's just so, I mean, there's literally like, we wrote this for China. I mean, and it's not necessarily the government. It's just you see a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of malware propagate there. Um, and like literally people writing notes like, wrote this for CN, here's my email address. All right, dude. Um, so reversing the actual malware itself is, is kind of like a talk in and of itself that I'm not gonna make you guys all suffer through. Um, I also kind of suck at reversing, so don't listen to anything I say about it. I'm not a reputable source. Um, but I, had, through a lot of trial and tribulation, did reverse a handful of these samples and uh, wrote up, did some IDB, some IDA uh, data files on it with uh, a bunch of different like comments and stuff like that. And, uh, but the good thing is sometimes you don't have to reverse anything. You, know? you can just submit it. Um, a quick analysis of what the particular malware sample did that I secured. Uh, it dropped a couple of other binaries. Uh, it added itself to startup, the usual crap. But the functions in it were named stuff like sin flood and UDP flood. So it was like, okay, this thing's 
probably going to be used for distributed denial of service attacks. So when I was actually executing the malware, doing some dynamic analysis, it's I, all I was seeing passed between the malware client and the server, the C2 itself, was just IP addresses, like just IP addresses. There were no like instructions, nothing like that. Like a ton of IP addresses, like random IP addresses. Figuring out like, okay, what, why, why are you passing all these IP addresses? So I ran some like geo lookups. I wrote this tool called geo, you can find it on my GitHub, um, which basically just returns to you the rough geographical coordinates of a particular IP address on the command line. Um, and they were all like in China or around China, like all the, and I was like, what, what is going on? What are all these IP addresses? Um, I also threw them up on a map, so that's like, yeah, pretty, pretty China-ish. Um, after a lot of research, I realized that these IP addresses were all like DNS servers and backbone routers and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm still like, okay, why, you know, what is this? Um, so as it turned out, I reversed the malware a little bit more and I talked to some folks. These IP addresses that it was passing were the malware targets. It was, it was the denial of service targets. So the malware is connecting out to the C2 or whatever, and the C2 is saying, here's a bunch of IP addresses, and then the malware is then spraying traffic at those IP addresses. And you can safely assume that the, the malware C2 is probably sending the same instructions out to everyone because they want everyone to perform these denial of service attacks on whomever their targets are. So I did the only reasonable thing I could think of and spent the next like month writing my own malware emulator client that would let me log all of the IP addresses and track who they were, track who they were targeting in real time. I spent hours staring at Wireshark, and I had to try not to kill myself, but I succeeded. I wrote this thing, um, this is what the code looks like. Uh, it's pretty, it's got a bunch of binary blocks. You can download it from my GitHub. Um, this is what the code actually does. Um, it connects to the C2, and it tells me in real time who the actors behind this are targeting as they're sending out the instructions to all their malware. So in real time, we can actually track who it is that they're trying to perform denial service attacks as they're sending the instructions out to the different compromised machines. So we've gone from setting up honeypots to identifying bad guys to tracking who the bad guys are targeting while they're targeting them. I think I have, I have a quick demo. Let's check literally right now and see who they are targeting. Hopefully they have targets. Sometimes they just don't have any targets. Um, I'm gonna like blow this up as much as I possibly can. All right, let's see if they have any targets right now. So that's the first response you get. And this is probably gonna take like, I'm running on a hotspot right now. This is probably gonna take like maybe, maybe like 30 seconds. Um, but if they are targeting anybody, what, what's gonna happen is we're eventually gonna get a response back and we're gonna see the IP address or the IP address is of the people that literally this very second they're targeting uh, with denial of service attacks. And oh, we got a response. And come on. There we go. Got an IP address right there. This is an IP address of who the bad guys are targeting literally this very second. So if we wanted to, we could find the contact information for who owns that IP address, we can send them an email and be like, hey, what up guys? You're about to get hit with a denial of service attack. You know? Or we can, we can learn more about the group by learning, well, why, who would perform denial of service attacks on you know, a random like, internet service provider, maybe a university, or maybe a, a company, or anything like that? Uh, it looks like we're getting more. Oh, whatever, you get the, you get the gist of it. So, so basically, oh god. So summary of the group themselves. They are based in China. Um, they're not necessarily a Chinese government. You know, they, that's just where they live. Um, they're not advanced at all. All they do is they guess credentials um, and then they download malware. They, they package up their malware a lot of the times with like auto exploit kits like for stuff that's like really old like MS-80067 which is a really common like the bread and butter of bugs of like compromising other machines. 
um, and they just guess passwords and their goals are basically build botnets and DDoS people. They don't send spam, they don't do stuff like that. They just perform denial of service attacks to do some kind of censorship or maybe they're just a gang of people who are, you know, whatever. Or maybe they even sell their botnets to people so that they can DDoS people. But the thing that I did learn is that they are actually somewhat smart about their targeting. Um, they target things like DNS servers and uh, like backbone routers and stuff like that because, you know, if, if your goal is to take down a website, uh, it's going to make more sense to just go after the DNS server so people can't resolve DNS to get to your website instead of trying to just like spam the crap out of, you know, an Apache server until it goes down, or at least that's one thing. So another quick recap. We have captured malware. We have analyzed it to identify what their capabilities are. And we have reversed that little custom binary protocol between them to figure out who the targets are in real time. So some of my kind of closing notes. The end result of this is we are able to track the group's targets in real time. We have malware artifacts and we have C2 IP addresses to block from our networks. We know who the C2s are. We know where the attacks are coming from. We know a lot of different things. So we've gathered a lot of information from these guys. And what, another one of the cool things is, I mean, there, there's a list. I think I actually go into it from here. Ah, well, go on. The majority of this intelligence is gathered just from one piece of malware from one campaign. Uh, there are a lot of these campaigns happening literally right now all the time. You just need to find them. So set up some honeypots, you know, do, uh, do, you know, read through this and take anything that's useful to you, set up honeypots, start looking at bad guys as they're executing attacks. On my to-do list, um, I want to track more of these C2s. I've actually started doing that since I wrote this slide. Um, I want to build an NSE script, like an NMAP scanning script, so that because there's a custom signature that I've identified for the C2s, and I want to be able to see um, where the other C2s are, and like maybe if there are other groups using the same piece of software. Um, it was actually interesting. The guy who helped me um, uh, reverse some of the malware is this guy. Uh, he runs. They, it's a it's a group of people um, that run a group called Malware Must Die. And uh, really, really smart group of people. And I was talking to the guy, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to do all this stuff. And he was like, he was like, yeah, let me help you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, it's so cool of you. Like, can I donate some money? Like, you're really, really helping me out. Can I like, just donate like, for like, hosting? And he goes, no, we don't do it for malware. We do it we don't do it for money. We do it because we hate malware. I was like, Jesus, all right, man. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I wish I loved anything as much as you hate malware. Um, <laughs> The other thing is that I would like to I would like to fuzz the uh, the, the custom service that is written. Actually, kind of going back to Mr. Malware Must Die, um, they recently don't know how um, acquired a copy of the same software that belongs that was being used by the same group that I've been tracking, and they like posted a picture of it, but they haven't released it yet. And the reason it's so or the reason that I knew this is because the default port number is this like really random. Uh, really high port number and when I was looking at the screenshot I was like oh holy crap that's the same screenshot of the group that I'm tracking so I've been like blowing this guy's Twitter up trying to get him to send me the file but he's not doing it um, some other stuff that I want to do is I want to figure out how to identify other um, compromised clients uh, conventionally there are a lot of different ways to do this uh, like if, if it's like uh, if you're if you've got malware that's using like an IRC server or something like that sometimes you can literally just log into the IRC server and see like all of the host names and IP addresses of other compromised clients. I'd like to let people know, hey, your box got popped. Um, I would like to build up an automated notification system so that as these target IP addresses are, are leaked out of the, um, out of the C2 or they're, as the instructions are sent out, there's like an automatic who is lookup of that IP address and then an email gets sent out to like the contact email address and says like, hey guys, you know, batten down the hatches because you guys are about to get hit with the DDoS attack. I also would like these people to not know who I am because um, that would not be fun. And I would also like to build uh, a map of their targets that, auto that updates itself in real time because that would just be like super cool. Why wouldn't I want to do that? Um, so kind of some things that I'm hoping uh, that I've been trying to convey a little bit is that threat intelligence is not that hard uh, to do kind of as an individual or something that you want to get into. It's easy to ball on a budget. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not rocket science necessarily. Get out there and track some targets. Install honeypots. Uh, start looking for bad guys. Uh, warning, your personal hygiene and your interpersonal relationships with other people will suffer tremendously because you will get obsessed um, and you'll stop bathing and you'll just start spending all, time, all day in your computer. 
which, I mean, who am I kidding? I was doing that anyway. Um, and don't forget, any information that you get, share your information with other people. Give back. Uh, you know, there, there are companies that charge a lot of information for this kind of stuff and, uh, you know, and do really, really cool stuff. Right now, we're just ballers on budgets. Give your information to everybody. Um, share the attacker IP addresses that you find. Share the malware samples, stuff like that. Um, you know, and give back to other people. Uh, just to give some credit to people, we've got, of course, Mr. Malware Must Die. Um, Cardio DB is the, the, um, the database, the thing that I used to render that map earlier. Malware.com, Virus Total. Uh, Cloud at Cost is that hosting provider I talked about at the very beginning with like the stupid good deals. Um, Threatstream, Managed Honey Network, uh, that's the GitHub page. Um, my buddy Rob, who helped me reverse a lot of this stuff, who's like super crackhead reverser. Um, and then my old boss, Nat, for helping me get interested in this uh, threat intel stuff. Um, oh, hang on, before I go to that awesome slide. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Anyone? Yes, in the back. Sure, no, totally understood. So the question was, uh, during the course of my research, did I identify any low-cost visualization software? There is a package called like Kippo, uh, it's called like Kippo Visualizer, Kippo Visualization. Um, it's a separate thing that I think someone else wrote, but it basically gives you graphs of like, you know, this is a pie chart of this one IP address is doing this, here are the top passwords that we're seeing be used that somebody did already do, I'm sorry? Oh yeah, Kippo Graph. Thank you. Kippo Graph is what it's called. Um, but yeah, I've, that's I haven't used it, but it, it looks it looks cool. Uh, any other questions? Yes, in the back. What what's my GitHub link? Wow, crap! How did I forget to put that here? Um, it's my first name dash my last name Andrew dash Morris. It's somewhere. it's somewhere on here. If you want my slides, I'll send them out to everybody. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Yes. Interesting. So the question is, have I seen a change recently because uh, attackers traditionally were using wget and they switched over to secure FTP. I have not. Um, I see a lot of wget and a lot of curl. Yeah, but I haven't seen, I mean, the guys that I'm looking at, are, they're real dumb. And the other thing that I've noticed is if you use different hosting providers, like if you use uh, AWS for some of your honeypots and you use Cloud at Cost for some of your other ones, what you want to do is you want to find like the shadiest VPSs you can possibly find, like buy a prepaid credit card to pay with them because those are the ones that no one's paying any attention to them. Like AWS at least aggregates security statistics on all their stuff. But like if you get, you know, grandma's VPS in Russia or whatever, uh, they don't do anything. And so you will actually attract more attacks if you use like a shadier VPS, um, uh, like a, sh a shadier hosting provider. Uh, there, is a, there is a different demographic of people that go after AWS stuff, or the AWS attack space, than there are people that go after like cloud at cost stuff, which I can't really explain that, but it's something that I have observed. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? No? Okay, awesome. My name's Andrew. Uh, this is my Twitter, that's my, uh, that's my email address, and that's me really drunk holding on to a dog. Thank you very much.